Right, so let's continue with the third part of our lecture. Um, topics will be uh, UML and testing. Um, first of all, as a reminder for the organizational stuff, uh, if you haven't registered in Moodle yet, please do so. Here's the link and uh, here's also the password uh, to, to join the course. And uh, for all organizational stuff and messages and so on, it's just a lot more simpler if we can do this, uh, this way in Moodle. All right, um, as I've already mentioned, uh, two topics today. One is going to be UML and also modeling. This is kind of a recap if you've already visited the modeling class. Otherwise, of course, it's kind of helpful to, to uh, hear that uh, in any case. And the second part will be about testing, specifically unit testing for, uh, for this part. All right, so <coughs> let's look at UML. UML stands for Unified Modeling Language, and this is used to yeah, visualize some uh, sort of system design. Um, it's an ISO standard uh, since, uh, I think, 2000, and yeah, currently it's 2.5, doesn't really matter. Uh, the important thing is there's actually uh, 14 different types of diagrams. This is quite a lot, um, and they're uh, divided into structure diagrams and behavior diagrams. We don't need all that 14. We're going to look at the most uh, important uh, diagram types uh, in a moment. Um, and depending on what type of tool you use, you can also use UML to auto-generate uh, uh, Java code, for example. So you draw a class diagram and then the UML tool will actually generate the, the code for you. All right, so here's a couple of links um, for tools you might want to use. There's Wirelet, Umlet, Argo UML. These are editors for uh, UML and if you I need to draw a UML diagram that um, is actually planned to, to happen later in the, in the exercises, then you can use any of these. There's also online tools, just look for anything that's uh, comfortable for you. So I already mentioned there's 14 different types of diagrams, we don't need all of them. There's five that are quite common. The, by far the most common one is the class diagram. This is from the from the category of structure diagrams. And then there's uh, these four behavioral diagrams, sequence, use case, state, and activity diagram. And these are yeah, behavioral diagrams, which are the most common ones. In any case, if you ever see this sort of box and dashed line box with a little uh, earmark, then this is a comment. This is nothing that's uh, strictly defined within UML, so this is just an explanatory note in any case. Um, but now let's look at the individual uh, types of diagrams. First of all, the class diagram. And um, this shows how a class is structured. Um, it shows almost all of the properties of, of a class like we discussed last time in the recap of object-oriented programming. So of course we have the class name, this is here in the first, uh, first section, oops, I'm sorry, class name. Then we have the attributes, um, of course the, uh, the size, for example, of the window, visibility uh, and some kind of pointer maybe. Um, and below that we have the method. So these are the three main parts of a class in UML. Then in addition, we also have um, little additional attributes to de uh, designate if something is public, protected or private. Um, package scope, uh, like we have in Java, is not specifically defined here. So if you leave out that uh, that indicator, then this can be uh, interpreted as as meaning um, package scope, but this is not part of UML strictly. Um, if you have italic and underlined uh, methods, then they are either abstract or static. Same applies, of course, to um, uh, static can also apply to, to attributes. You can have static attributes, static methods, like we discussed last time. Um, so all of these together uh, give you a pretty, pretty good overview over what a, a class, uh, the features a class has. And last but not least, up here, uh, we can also have uh, generics, parameters, 
Um, we also talked about those last uh, time. Generics are very suitable for things like container classes. Uh, in this example now it's a Boolean parameter. That's maybe not a, a really perfect example, but in any case, if you see this a dashed box on top of a, a class object in UML, then that means it's a template or a, or a generic. All right, so another very important part of UML is that you can also show the relation between classes, um, especially inheritance and implementation, for example. Inter inheritance is something we already talked about last time. Um, if you remember, we have, uh, of course, we can have superclasses, which are like generalizations, and we have subclasses, which are specializations. So, for example, if we have uh, money storage as a superclass, then a uh, bank account is a kind of money storage and wallet is a kind of money storage so they share certain properties and um, in UML this is designated by a upwards arrow not non-filled upwards arrow usually um, that means that this class is a subclass of this one um, we can also have the interface relation, so this is kind of orthogonal to the superclass-subclass relation. We can also have interfaces on top of that. Interfaces are usually described with this modifier in uh, UML. So this is a purely abstract class which doesn't have functionality on its own but only provides an interface and the actual implementation is then uh, uh, designated with this dashed arrow and usage also with a dashed arrow but without a, a field head. So wallet is an implementation of this iWallet interface and owner is a class that uh, then uses this iWallet interface. So that's how, how you can read this part of the diagram basically. All right, um, next up, what's also very important in UML is that you can also show relations between classes on top of uh, the subclass superclass relation. So for example, we have composition. That means one object contains the other one. This is the filled diamond. Um, and here you also already see the multiplicity. So um, on each side of the um, of the association, you see these little numbers which give you how many objects of each type are involved. So uh, this diagram you can basically translate into plain text as one car contains one to two motors. And in the case of composition, that means that the outer object is a container and uh, the inner objects are kind of can only exist uh, in conjunction with the outer object. So that means if you basically uh, wreck the car, then the motors will also be uh, destroyed. On the other hand, uh, we also have aggregation. Um, this is the non-filled diamond, and this can be translated as has. So here the, uh, the inner objects can actually exist separately. Um, the example here is that we have one pond and that has a some, something between zero and very many ducks. So on each pond we have an arbitrary number of ducks and this also means that if you uh, fill in the pond basically, so if you destroy the this object then the ducks will just fly away so they can exist on their own without uh, the, the outer object as opposed to the container relation where if you delete the container then the inner object will also be removed. And of course you can also have more complex uh, relations where uh, the relation itself also has uh, attributes for example. So this is sometimes modeled by a separate class and in this example, uh, you ha can have an arbitrary number of classes on the left, non-profits in this example, you can have an arbitrary number of objects on the right, donors, and each of these individual relations has an, an attribute. So the, the translation into plain English of that would be that every donor gives to some arbitrary number of non-profits, and each non-profit has an unrelated number of donors, and for each individual connection, for each donation, you have an individual amount. So this is a very complex relation, but this is still something you can model within UML and which you could also represent as, as Java classes, for example. 
All right, so much for the class diagrams. So now let's look at some of the behavioral diagrams. One common thing, especially when you're uh, communicating with, with less technically inclined people, with customers in many cases, is the use case diagram. So here we have actors, which are actually these little, little people here, and we have actions, which are here inside the system. And this is um, supposed to be kind of a, a model of the real world. So here we have a restaurant basically modeled and we have people like the chef and the waiter and uh, the customer and all of these um, execute some specific action so like the, the waiter um, receives the order the um, customer actually eats the, the food after the, the chef has cooked the food and so on and so on so this is kind of a model of the real world which doesn't really uh, reflect too many system internals. So this can actually be a starting point for some kind of uh, restaurant management system, for example, but um, it doesn't really show you anything about the, the internal classes or anything like that. So this is, uh, is quite suitable for talking to like the, the manager of the restaurant if you're tasked with developing such a system to actually see if, if you, you are on the same page and you understand the the tasks that the system will have to to fulfill in the same way all right so another more technical behavioral diagram is the so-called sequence diagram so here we have objects on the top as these boxes so these are individual objects usually and um, the lifetime of an object or the time when it's active and actually doing something is designated by these filled boxes and whenever one object makes a, a method call to another object or uh, sends a message to another object then this is uh, indicated by these arrows and by these uh, these dashed arrows then are the response uh, especially uh, if they are asynchronous so you can um, you can model several objects doing things in parallel easily with uh, this system um, and you can also um, indicate for example when this line here this uh, vertical dash line ends that an object has uh, ceased to exist that it was deleted for example um, so for somewhat more complex um, internal system behaviors this can sometimes be quite helpful to to visualize yeah, the lifetimes and the the uh, the calls in between objects and also the um, dependencies. All right, then uh, another behavioral diagram that's quite common is the state diagram. This is uh, at a relatively high level. This is somewhere between the the use case diagram and the. Um, uh, sequence diagram so here we have states and we have transitions between these states and each transition uh, is basically a response to an a external event and we also have a starting transition which basically shows the initial state so let's say we are modeling some kind of simulator then in the uh, the initial state will be that the simulator stopped and when the user then clicks on the start button then it changes to running then we have another state uh, which is pause so we can either pause or continue the simulation and when it's in a pause state then we can also request a, a log file and after the data has been retrieved we can continue and go back to, to the running state from that we can also go back to the stopped state or to pause and so on so this is a rather simple example and it's still at a relatively high level but um, to, to model for example embedded systems this is quite common and also quite helpful to visualize what's going to happen inside uh, the system. All right. Last but not least, we have the activity diagram. So if you're uh, familiar with a flowchart, then the activity diagram is actually kind of an extended version of the flowchart. So we have these uh, also a starting uh, state and then we have these decisions inside. Maybe uh, if inexperienced participants are in the group, then we go to this uh, action. 
otherwise we go to this action and so on then we have another decision and so on the important aspect of the activity diagram which is uh, in addition to the plain old flowchart are these black bars these indicate concurrency so if we arrive at this point let's say we we decide that we have exactly one idea available here then um, we come to this black bar and then uh, at the same time the idea is presented and recorded so this means these two actions happen in parallel and then at the other black bar we join back to, to one single action and decide if we don't have time left then we go to wrap up and, and exit. If we still have time left then we may end up here at the second uh, uh, the second uh, concurrent part and then these two actions again happen in parallel and afterwards we go back to, to this part. So this is the most important aspect of the activity diagram um, and all the other parts are quite similar to, to a, a flowchart which you may already have seen. All right. Um, so much for the individual UML diagram types. So um, in general, when using UML, it's best to use that for uh, documentation and communication with other people, with other parts of your team, with other customers, for example. Um, it's usually not a good idea to let UML diagrams grow too large because then they become just very hard to understand sometimes. Um, occasionally, it can be helpful to use that code generation feature I mentioned in the beginning so that you first draw the UML diagram and then the tool will actually generate like a code representing the class structure and so on for you. Um, the problem is that often you will then uh, run into issues when you actually start changing the code and the code and the diagram kind of diverge from each other. So then you will always have to keep updating either the diagram um, and or regenerate the code and that's getting kind of tricky quite quickly. So um, you, there are also tools which do the other do it the other way around, which um, can take your existing Java code, for example, and create a class diagram from that. That's also sometimes quite useful. So especially in the later stages of your project, when you want to create a diagram for documentation and don't want to draw it again from by, by hand, then you can just create a diagram from the code. So both ways are possible, but it's usually very hard to keep them uh, in sync all the time. So for that reason, this is kind of to, to uh, something you should use only carefully. All right. So last but not least, if nobody actually requires you to use UML, if it's not strictly required, then you can also just use so-called box and line diagrams. And here's an example which I took off uh, of a whiteboard sketch um, from a project a few years back. So just about any whiteboard sketch already qualifies as box and line diagram. So you just have some sort of uh, box or uh, other container for any sort of system component and lines or arrows in between to indicate communication between those um, between those system components and you can of course nest them so smaller um, uh, smaller components can be inside larger ones and depending on what you write next to the uh, arrows you can also indicate what sort of data is actually communicated so this is often all, is quite sufficient to to communicate the basic layout of your uh, of your system and the initial ideas so uh, if nobody requires you to use UML, then it's worth considering if you just need to use a simpler diagram type uh, without having to go up through all the exact UML um, requirements. All right, so much for UML, I think. So next up is uh, testing.